we had a site view a few Saturdays ago, and I'll let the applicant uh, pick up with their presentation and we can uh, follow up with questions and see where we're gonna go tonight. Sure, thank you, Chair. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Boshinen. I'm general manager for Green Jeans Farms. Um, with me here on the call is Tom Reedy, our counsel with Bacon Wilson. And since the site walk, we have not made any site plan changes, but we have made a change to our proposed odor control plan. And I submitted a document to the board on Tuesday night. And if the board would like, I can pull that up and talk through it. Just let me know, Roger, if we're moving to that. That's a good place to start, sure. Okay, one second, Julie, while I sure. um, make you a co-host. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what we were previously proposing was an odor neutralizing mist that would come out of a ring attached to the outside of the exhaust fans of the greenhouse. And I think there was, you know, some concerns from the board and the abutters about that because that was um, something unique that was proposed that the other applicants in town had not. So with that, we decided to change over to um, carbon trays, carbon filters, which is what has been approved uh, with the other greenhouses in town. And the reason why initially I didn't want to propose these is because I really would like the site to be sustainable, energy efficient, waste efficient. And what I had known about carbon filters was that there are these big cylinders that need to be thrown out. They're heavy metal that need to be thrown out every few months or so. And, and I didn't like the idea of that, but I talked to our consultant and we spoke with this company. It's an American company that makes refillable carbon trays. So you buy the carbon trays, you attach them to the outside of the exhaust fans and you can refill the carbon pellets um, every few months or as needed for odor control. So it's, um, just like it's activated carbon. So similar to activated charcoal, it's very clean. Um, the outside of the tray um, has a perforated face guard that holds everything in. And then we can actually, what I really like about the refillable is we can use that. We have a, a part of our state regulations are that we have to dispose our uh, plant waste uh, with a one-to-one -one ratio of organic matter. And so we can actually use this towards our waste management plan. Um, so, you know, I really like it and I'm hopeful that um, the board and, and the abutters will feel more comfortable with this. So who's your... Um specialist now who's going to be installing this these are specially made by this company air filters um, we call them we work with them to make sure that they fit to the exhaust fans on the greenhouse and then our construction contractor would install them so it's not an actual odor specialist who's installing it no, but they are made for, especially for cannabis. So in the presentation that we had uh, at the November meeting concerning the um, iodine product that's assay no longer proposed? Correct. We are no longer using that. So Julie, are these types of filters used anywhere else in the area today? I'm not sure about these specifically, but they are the identical 
um, you know, types of materials that are going to be used in the greenhouses that are being constructed now on River Road, is my understanding, and the other greenhouses. Okay, it says re replaced every three months. So is marijuana going to be growing 12 months a year in these greenhouses? It will, but the marijuana will only be flowering a few months out of the year. So I had explained before, there's, there's basically two phases of the plant. There's the vegetative phase, which is eight weeks typically. And then there's a flowering phase, which is eight weeks, but the smell only comes in when those flowers are maturing in the last few weeks. Okay. And what kind of air system moves the odors through these filters? Yep, so we'll have large um, 24 by 12 exhaust vans, two of those on the outside of the greenhouse, so on each end of the doorway, and the exhaust fan will pull the air through the filter, which is on the outside. Are they going to be changed on a, just a straightforward three month filter or is it, I mean, three month schedule or is there um, some other way you measure the three months? I envision that, I mean, we'll be on site every day. So I would like it to be that if odor is noticeable, we'll change them immediately. But I think three months is a good goal. And is there any sort of um, alarm system, either sound or, or light that goes on that shows when the filters need to be changed? There's not. And who at um, the farm would be in charge of the filters? I would and our head grower would as well. Is, and I don't know if this was mentioned before or not, is there a way of detecting odor? I mean, other than people being there and smelling it, but are, is there instruments that can detect odor that you would know whether the fans are this, uh, are the carbon filters are working or not? No, Fred, I've never heard of that before, but we will be again, in with the plants every day, walking by close to the greenhouses every day, and we'll know what the plant schedule is so that we're able to prepare to make sure that those filters are changed. Okay. Um, how, how many people will be on site every day? You, you said that somebody will be on site every day, but is there a number? We'll have five to six people on site every day. Okay. I had some questions concerning the greenhouses to be rebuilt and Tom Reedy had cited uh, the governor's COVID-19 order number 42. I pulled that up and made a copy of it, but I don't have a copy of, and um, I apologize, is Tom's actual memo. You could call that up, Julie, if that's available. I can, yep. Is that the tolling section? Right. Yeah. yeah. Is this the right section? Yes. Yeah, okay. The greenhouse destroyed December 22, 2018. The deadline to rebuild would be normally December 22, 2020. 
Okay, the landowner then would have 287 days. That's what Tom says, according to order number 42. And then 287 days hasn't expired, has not expired yet from that date. So that would be March 29, 2022. Um, so now these greenhouses have not been reconstructed yet, correct? Correct. So right now you have a little less than three months. The 287 days. Tom, um, uh, you're on the call, I know. So <clears throat> I read order 42 and the first problem is I don't see that it, it automatically applies to a rebuilding situation. So where do you derive that from? So while it doesn't specifically say <clears throat> rebuilding just because I don't think that the the government was thinking about every specific instantiation of what an approval could run to and so we took so we took approval broadly and then we also thought about the permit extension act if, if you recall from 2008 to 2012 um, which is similar and and as you can appreciate, Mr. Chairman, there's there's no case law on this um, where you could look into say, well, how broadly has it been applied? And I I think it's because most folks who have interpreted it had been had understood the intent of its creation, where but for this interceding event, some action was supposed to take place, and that because of this interceding event, the action could not take place. And the person who could have taken the action would be prejudiced by this interceding event occurring if they would have had to take that action during that time. And hopefully I'm not speaking too much in generalities, but it's, well, so to answer your question directly, it doesn't specifically say rebuilding, but taking the intent and purpose of what this state of emergency and order 42 and the frequently asked questions or interpretation of it we felt comfortable opining that it would run to this rebuilding. All right, I understand. So to characterize it in as neutral a fashion as I can, I looked at number 42, it talks about certain very specific deadlines that were told or extension, extended um, such as constructive approvals of which can happen in the zoning context, such as hearings that had started but not finished, such as decisions that were in the process of being rendered, such as appeal rights. Um, and, and so there's no single broad statement, for instance, that said any deadline that would fall under any um, zoning bylaw of any town in the Commonwealth is going to be extended. And so there is nothing as broad as that. And I wouldn't expect that there would ordinarily be something as broad as that, but I wanted to see for myself what it, what it says. So basically what characterize your uh, words, you're arguing by analogy that the rebuilding uh, two-year deadline should be extended in the same fashion. Right. Got Correct. Okay. Okay. So, any questions about that, board members? Okay, but this uh, applies to rebuilding the existing greenhouses for the same use. And aren't we changing the use now from agricultural, if you want to call it that, to growing uh, marijuana? And if we are, these are going to be an AR1, which is that in going to compliance with our zoning bylaw? Marijuana is an agricultural crop. Well, is it or isn't it? 
think we've interpreted it that way. Well, I think you'll find that it's listed under agricultural uses in the table of use. It well, is, not, it is just... not exempt from these Commonwealth's agricultural zoning exemptions, which is the distinction that most people make. <laughs> Maybe this would be a good time to look at the site plan, and I'd like to see the the demarcation between AR1 and AR2, if you could. Sorry, I was muted. So the demarcation is here. Um, you can see it over here to the left, too, of this number that says 176.45. So you may recall there were, on the previously approved application, there were two greenhouses in this AR1 zone. Those are what were destroyed. And there's also a greenhouse here where it says proposed greenhouse number one. That was also destroyed. Okay, so they were destroyed. They were in AR1. They're going back in AR1. Um, One is going back in AR1. This proposed metal barn here is not being used for growing. It's used for storage. All right, okay. <clears throat> so we're talking about the rebuild of Greenhouse number one, correct? Correct. Right. And so, Fred, you're saying that's a different use? Huh? Uh, I, I guess it could be, depending how you interpret whether marijuana is an agricultural product or not? Well, I'll ask maybe an obvious question. What was it used for previously? Well, uh, I, growing I'm vegetables. I'm asking, I'm asking the applicant. Growing vegetables and tobacco seedlings. For our our section on abandoned uses, and Yeah, it's on um, page 17, 171-12. 171-12? Mm-hmm. Um, where it talks about the two years. Well, that talks about a non-conforming use. That, was, that wasn't a non-conforming use previously, was it? No, it was, it was a conforming use. Just that this use. is a conforming use. Insofar as they're allowed under the bylaw. Right. And so we've looked at 171-12D, Mr. Chairman, for non-conforming structures. Yeah. Thinking that any newly created structure subsequent to that uh 2018 date, that April 2018 date, would not therefore be allowed uh, if it were to be used for marijuana in the AR1. 
And so that's that's where we've started is to say, well, once it was destroyed, it had to have been reconstructed within those two years or otherwise that structure, which was lawfully located in the AR-1 and could have been used for marijuana as of April 2018 and subsequent to it. Once that December 2018 date came around and it was destroyed, we had two years to rebuild it. But that's where the interceding event of the pandemic happened and relying upon um, the joint order and order number 42, we've said that non-conforming use can still, or non-conforming structure rather, can still be reconstructed until March of 2022. Yes, thanks for focusing that uh, argument. Okay, so the Fred's counter to that is it's got to be the same use, and they, and they respond to that that's it's still an agricultural use. Um, so the board has to decide that particular series of questions. So, so if if this proposal came to the board a year ago, you'd be within the two years and. If they reconstructed the greenhouse, then they would be asking for growing marijuana in AR1. Forget the time period to it'd be within the two years. They could have reconstructed and they would be growing. We're saying they would be allowed to grow marijuana in AR1. And because they didn't reconstruct within two years, we're now, we're, I, we could be saying now that, okay, they can still grow marijuana in AR1. I guess, uh, are, are we setting a, a, a precedent on what's in AR1? Are we defining growing in AR1? Well, aren't they saying that if it was never destroyed and everything else was in compliance with the bylaw, they could grow it in AR1 because that's what the bylaw says. It allows <clears throat> existing greenhouses to be used. It's the act of destruction that we have to focus on. And, yeah, and it also looks, Mr. Chair, if you if you look at that 171.12D, that we could also request the special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals to, um, I guess, receive relief from strict application of that provision. And so, you know, I think we put it <clears throat> in the footnote suggesting that March is a tight timeline if we would need to. So, you know, taking a step back and looking more big picture, and Julie, you can fill in the, the blanks here. You know, Julie was in front of the planning board earlier this week. They had tentatively marked up a hearing for the end of January, assuming that we received approval from the zoning board this evening, which we're, we're hoping to get. You know, I think the, the odor um, control system coming into line with what you've already approved elsewhere was a big step in that direction. And so assuming that you can approve it conditioned on whatever conditions you do seek to impose, if subsequent to it, we would need to come back and say, hey, listen, we're trying, but we're not going to be able to do this by March. It looks to me that we could seek a special permit under 171.12d, where you could make a finding that we can still avail ourselves of this rebuild, even if it's subsequent to March. And, and I guess to, to speak to Fred a little bit, it's not that you have something so open-ended that anybody, I mean, this is a pretty discreet argument that we're trying to make based upon the existence of these structures, greenhouses particularly, in AR1 at the time that your bylaw said they needed to exist. And it's, so somebody couldn't, come back necessarily and say, oh, hey, by the way, we had greenhouses that existed, you know, let's say in 2017. Well, does that fall in line with the bylaw? Probably not. So practically in town, I can't imagine many greenhouses that had existed subsequently destroyed that would look to avail themselves of these, of this particular section in what we're talking about. So I don't know that you're setting a precedent here. If anything, I think uh, it's a pretty nuanced approach, so you um, you don't necessarily need to be worried about others coming.
I would agree. It seems to be unique as far as that is concerned, that there wouldn't be a bunch of others that were destroyed. Um, all right, so then that site plan up, we saw at the view the um, chain link fences and looking at the site plan. So is it three of the greenhouses that have that or proposed to have that chain link fence configuration? Yes. So we're, we're actually proposing um, cedar. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair. You mean the inside of the greenhouses? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So everywhere you, where you see the, the light gray, mm -hmm. that's actually, yep, one, two, three greenhouses. You're correct. So I guess it's five sides that would have the yep, that's interior channel. Five sides. So mm -hmm. uh, just in preparation for the start of the meeting, I was rereading some material that uh, was in circulation and I wanted to focus on uh, something that uh, the, uh, the chair of the planning board had submitted, I believe everyone's got it. It was on November 4th, and that was from Don Sluter, where he's talking about <clears throat> the 50 foot setback. And he says that, crucially, the planning board interprets the term marijuana establishment to encompass the entire cultivation facility, including the security fence, not just the buildings within the fence. Um, and so without going out to the security fence, it, it, what I wanted to raise for discussion is the, the concept that it isn't the barn itself certainly part of the establishment and, and therefore isn't the erection of that chain link fence somewhat arbitrary to try to get a measurement that, that, that fits within that 50 foot setback. But from a common sense standpoint, wouldn't anyone looking at it without any zoning sophistication or legal sophistication of any sort, just be able to say, hey, that barn is part of the whole process. And if the barn is closer than 50 feet, it shouldn't be allowed. I mean, I'm not saying that's my opinion, but I'm just saying that's, that's a topic I wanted to raise. So I hope others jump into that conversation. Roger, can you, or, or Julie, can you point out where, point out the setback concern that Roger is raising vis-a-vis -vis the barn? Sure. So can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, good. So if you see, I'm... Um, moving it along this greenhouse number one here. Uh huh. That's where the chain link would be. And on the site visit, that's where we saw the stakes on the right. side of the greenhouse. So were, were, were it to be measured, Deborah, from the outside of that greenhouse, you, you see the number 37.1 there. Yes. Uh, but you see 37.5 and then again, 39.1. And on the other side, you know, it's all obviously under 50. So mm -hmm. that's the issue. Mm -hmm. They're not seeking a variance in those circumstances. They're simply asking that from a measurement standpoint, it be considered within our special permit granting authority. I think, Roger, what, what maybe it's confusing here is there's no indication of, of where the 50 foot setback is to the greenhouses. You only show 39 feet, 37 feet. And I, I can see that the picture says the shaded or going from blue to shaded is, is the 50 foot line, but there's no dimension on this map saying that. Yeah, Fred, there's a lot going on, but it's the 50 foot line. Is there a dimension line. showing that? Yep, it is. It's at the top right here. Oh, it's just there's just a lot going on, so it's hard to see when you get down there. But these are the 50 foot setback. 
Oh, okay. If you follow them down, they match up with the where we're putting the fences in the interior. Oh, okay. So the issue for the board is without a variance request um, and just under our regular special permit authority, is it proper to exclude the exterior of the barn from the 50 foot measurement and then take the, the applicant's argument that the growing area only occurs inside the chain link area and it's so fact that the chain link distance to the boundary should be the measuring uh, parameters. May I make a comment on that? Sure. The, as, as I know you're aware, the 50 foot setback is larger than the typical 25 foot setback that most enterprises deal with. Um, when the planning board adopted this, we, we knew there were a lot of uncertainties. Um, three years into this, I had hoped that, and, and I think this is our fifth cultivation application, I had hoped that some of those uncertainties would have gone away. But the bulk of them relate, the, the ones I've heard from from a butters and that I know we all share, uh, primarily odor. Um, a butters have been concerned about potential intrusion from security cameras onto their property and their views and, and their lives uh, and noise. Um, you can argue that the noise here might not be greater than was previously, but nobody had any, any ability to regulate the noise. Um, moving the fences and the cultivation end doesn't obviate any of those three concerns. The odor filters are still outside that 50 foot setback. The fans are outside and the security fence and the cameras are outside. So I don't know whether it's a issue of, I guess the way you've defined it, it's an issue of special permit acceptance, but I would argue that until we know more about these, these issues that we really ought to be trying to keep all of that within the 50 foot setback. Are there others who would like to speak? Members of the public? Mr. Chair, if we could just respond to the, the comment about um, the structures. I think, Julie, we've done a little research and there is infrastructure fences, for example, within that 50 foot setback. And so there's precedent that has been set within the town where those fences need not be right up to that 50 foot mark. And so I think it's incumbent on the board to take that into consideration. Um, Which fences, Tom, are you talking about? The outside fences? Yes, yes, the outside fences. And, and relying upon what growing, you know, because the, the growing can occur, cannot occur within the setback, which is precisely what we're doing here. It doesn't say venting, it doesn't say security cameras, um, it doesn't say noise. It's growing, and so the the growing will not occur, um, and ostensibly the use will not occur outside can, of the fifty feet. Can you give an example? Can you document the which fence? Because, well, 
the, the only one I'm aware of that's within the 50 foot setback was a specific variance granted because of an environmental issue. Julie, do you have those? Do you have those other ones? Um, I believe, so one was the river road application and I think there were the two of the river road applications. One of the buildings was within the front setback. I don't have it up, but. I think by the time it was approved by the planning board, that's not entirely true. Judy, I think that that letter also discusses that the planning board was under the impression that the fence is a requirement and it's something that we feel for us and the neighborhood is, is best for security, but it, it's not required as part of the facility. I, I, I'm afraid the letter was poorly drafted. We, we normally reference the security perimeter the perimeter of the secured area. And in an indoor facility, that would be the building um, where you have a collection of buildings like this. Um, it's certainly possible to do something other than a fence, but you are required to, to maintain security in a defined area. And there has to be some some entity to make that definition. Um, I've spent a little time thinking about what a collection of greenhouses that might be. Um, I come up with kind of facetious answers like a moat, but, um, but I think the offense is the only practical one. But we, we, the letter should have said to the perimeter of the secured area. And, and even then, if if I may, you know, when you look back at the previous approval for this very site, get issued by the Zoning Board of Appeals, and Julie, I don't know if you have that one. That's the one with the blue and the green plan. The security fence, or as you're calling it, the the secured area, was within that 50 foot setback as approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so the only inference we can make is that the interpretation is that as, as the Zoning Board of Appeals has the want to do, the security fence can exist within that 50 foot. And so by inference then, the, the growth is what the use is. And so that's what we must keep outside of that 50 feet. You know, in, in an ideal world, in another iteration, you may be able to more crisply define what is to be and what is to be without that 50 foot. All we can do is say, well, here's what they've done in other places. This sets the ground rules. And then looking at the plain language of the, the bylaw and saying, okay, here's, you know, in a reasonable interpretation would equate to, and we think it's what we've proposed here. And, you know, just to put it in perspective, you're not talking a lot of, about a lot of square feet here. And again, what, what Julie has said, because I, and I've said it to her, I said, Julie, why not just cut down the greenhouses? Why not just <clears throat> obviate this whole issue, terminate the greenhouses at the, at the 50 foot mark. And, and she is, I mean, you've heard it tonight. You've heard it for the past couple of months. She's sensitive to the agrarian use in this area and allowing the farmers, should this not work the way that everybody's hoping it will, to utilize those greenhouses for some other agricultural use besides marijuana and not to suffer the financial hardship by reducing them only to in the future potentially expand them again. And so I just, I don't want to lose sight of where, where we're coming from here, respectfully. Roger, I have a question. Yes. Um, can we uh, just think for a minute about the, um, the so-called Mustang project on the corner of Route 5 and Christian Lane. And it was uh, within the, the, um, the setback requirement from a public park, namely the baseball field across the street. We gave, them a, we gave them a waiver. We gave them a waiver, correct. And one of the reasons we gave them the waiver was that there was no cultivation that was going to go on in the first 
X number of feet of those greenhouses, correct? And that was because the, the as they're called, the head house is filled with all the electronics and the water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How is that different um, from the proposal to put the chain link fence um, at the 50 foot mark? How, how, how is that different? Uh, we allowed them a waiver because there's technically no growing going on yet, uh, by extension of Judy's argument, uh, those systems that are, are within the um, setback uh, are essential to the growing. So um, how is this different? Well, I, I remember that case and I don't, <clears throat> I don't dispute you that there was discussion that there was no growing in that area of that greenhouse, but from my perspective, at least, it seemed rather far from that ball field. Ball field gets a small amount of use, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, and there was that uh, line of fairly dense trees in between the greenhouse and the ball field. So yeah, that might have been one factor that there was no use going on that, in that part of the greenhouse, but I don't think that was the only factor. Um, uh -huh. I don't think it was the only. Uh, my recollection is that the ventilation did not go to the to the north. I think that's and right. so the so the odor would not have gone in that direction. The, the odor control systems were still outside that setback. And as far as that outside fence, I don't, I wasn't inclined to uh, beat the petitioner up over the outside fence. Um, so the fact that we approved, if we did it with the earlier um, urban grown project that the outside fence was within the 50 foot setback, to me is not determinative of, of this particular issue. Um, I mean, it seems like a, You know, I just say it seems like a cute argument to get around a pretty uh, plainly stated requirement. Um, and yeah, okay, so the plants over here and not over here, but you know, the plants growing in that whole environment. It, it seems it seems a bit tortured to me when, in fact it doesn't seem like it's impossible to to do what Urban Grown did, which was flip around those greenhouses or however they did it. I mean, you have the blueprint there for how we proved something in the past. Why are you now sort of going through a um, somewhat tricky <laughs> navigational path to, to get to that same result, you know, Leaves me scratching my head, but I'm also, you know, I don't, I don't want to block something uh, just by myself necessarily. So I'm interested in the collective opinion of everybody. I guess I don't hear a lot of abutters objecting to that portion of, of this proposal. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, this is Mike Becta. Could you please read the statement the planning board chair sent? My computer connection is very sporadic tonight ever since they changed our poll over as part of the Christian Lane change out there and having difficulties. You want me to read the Don Sluter statement again? Yes, if you would, please. So on November 4th, he wrote... <clears throat> Note that paragraph C-7 of the marijuana bylaw defines the 50 foot setback requirement as being applicable to marijuana establishments and he under, or underlines the word establishments. And then in quotations, he says marijuana establishment, end quotes, is a defined term bylaw and references a marijuana cultivator, independent testing lab, marijuana product manufacturer, marijuana retailer, 
type of marijuana related business licensed by the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Highlighted this next section. Crucially, the planning board interprets the term marijuana establishment to encompass the entire cultivation facility, including the security and fence, not just the buildings within the fence. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not focusing on that outside fence, but the cultivation facility, I like the way he phrases it, to me would be that entire barn. Um, and then the measurement should be from that entire cultivation facility. And that's where the 50 feet versus the 37.1 or the 37.5 comes into play. Okay, because that was one of my questions I had at the beginning is being the whole greenhouse is necessary because you're using the airspace to regulate humidity, heat, whatever. And then the exhaust fans were outside of that, which is crucial to the growing. And now we have a whole new kind of odor abatement system that I didn't even know about till seeing the meeting tonight to be able to see if there's any data with it from the company to uh, the success rate, how it works, or to be able to do any research outside of uh, the meeting time to see if I had any questions to to how it transpires. And I think Julie said something about a 12 by 24 fan. So the fans are gonna be smaller than what's there now. Is that true, Julie? No, there's a range of sizes of fans that are there now. Okay, Julie, so what was that 12 by 24 fan that you said uh, was gonna blow the air through the carbon filter. That's the size that, that's one of the sizes of the carbon trays. And I'm not sure how we're going to exactly size the exhaust fans right now. So there still is a possibility for odor escape because uh, the sizing dimensions haven't been determined to know how effective the system would be. Is that a fair statement? No, it's not. The exhaust fans will be sized to the size of the greenhouse. And then the carbon filters will be sized based on those. Okay, so the, the company can build filters to the size of the fan you have available. Correct. Okay. But Will, if, could you use your pointer, Julie, please, to show where those exhaust fans will be placed? Yes. So they exist now. There's two that exist on the outside of greenhouse number three. Mm -hmm. I believe there's one or two that exist here in greenhouse number two. And they will stay there? Correct. Okay, They're so in that's good working order. No, I, the only reason I ask is that does seem to um, support Roger's contention that the cultivation area is includes this space. Um, I'm not sure that that was what I gathered from Bob's reading of the definition the last time that we met. Okay. And again, like Tom said, where I'm coming from is we have agreed at certain times of the year that the landowner can use these greenhouses for his tobacco. This is going to remain a working farm. It's important to them and their business. And so by cutting these greenhouses, which the landowner never agreed to in the initial application, I don't know what, what happened, if there's a, a miscommunication, but that's something that is important to them that those greenhouses remain those dimensions. It cuts down the amount of tobacco that they can then plant that year. They can't fit the same number of trays in those greenhouses. Okay, so that confuses me a little bit. <clears throat> me too. <laughs> part-time marijuana hoop barn and part-time tobacco hoop barn? 
Is that, is that what it's? It's it's not part time. It's flexible so that they can continue their tobacco business. All right, but so walk me through it. So, what months of the year is going to be marijuana? What months of the year is going to be tobacco? Typically, they have the tobacco seedlings in there in May and June. And there's no marijuana in there at those times? Correct. Make yourself some supper. This is going to go on. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. It's all right. What's the growing cycle for marijuana from seed to, I guess, picking or whatever you call it, harvest? It's 16 weeks. So it's typically wow. May. <laughs> May to October. And so the tobacco typically goes into these first three greenhouses, just to the front portions of them. And how about the back two greenhouses? Are those exclusively marijuana? Yes. Can you scroll the um, screen down a little bit so we can see those two? Sure. So for, for them two, four and five, it would appear that the exhaust fans would be within the 50 foot setback, right? That's right. So we agreed to move greenhouse number four, which exists currently where my mouse is, okay. moving that over. Greenhouse five is a totally new greenhouse. Now for the, the fans would be mounted, I understand, on the outside of the, of the greenhouse, the, the outside the gray area. Okay, that's, that's the fans blowing out. Are you gonna need on the other end of the greenhouses, vents or louvers or something to get air in? Yes, so on one end, which would be the back end or the top of this image, yeah. Greenhouse four and five would be the intake fans. So two on each, so four all together. Right. And then, but, and go ahead, Fred. But like a, on greenhouses three, two and three, mm -hmm. the intake fans would be at the, at the what, 30 foot line? They would be, yes. At that line right there, okay. Yep, and this one here. Does anyone have that figure 14 from the prior approval? Is this the one you mean, Chair? Can you see it? I can't see it yet.
How about now? Yeah. All right, so the green legend says shortened and relocated greenhouses. So that was the concept of actually shortening them. But at least now we can, I, I think I have a better picture of why you're so reluctant to do that if the owners want to have another crop and use all of that space, all of that greenhouse space. Yeah, Deborah, it's that. And it's also a situation that Tom talked about earlier where if we, for some reason, can't get our license, mm -hmm. um, if we're stalled for some time that they're not subject to their greenhouses being shortened and having less space to do their other crops. Okay. You wouldn't do the short until you got the actual final license, right? No, so the way that the state licensing works is that you're granted a provisional license, which means that you are granted approval to build out your uh, facilities and they have to match everything has to be completed in order for you to get an inspection once that inspection is done which can take I've heard stories that it can take six to six months to a year um, for the state to give you final approval after final approval you need permission to operate which is another vote so it's a very long uh, construction and, and inspections process. And that's where my sensitivity comes in. All right, well, that answers that question. Mm -hmm. Who does the final inspection? The state, the state has an inspector come out and I've heard there's been no cases where they don't have something to be picky about. So then we have to go back and make, make the changes they want. They come back out again and then the uh, Cannabis Control Commission meets once a month. So if you don't get onto the next agenda, you have to wait. So it, it takes a long time. Well, I guess the question that begs to be asked is <clears throat> why would the owners of authorized urban grown to shorten the greenhouses if they, and I assume were back then, growing tobacco? If you know. I don't, I wish I knew that answer. Roger, it's not typical for any Wheatley farmer to grow the same volume of tobacco any, every year. And, and what, what should I do with that information, Judy? How, I don't understand. Well, it's variable is all I'm trying to say. No, I just meant that maybe that year they weren't growing any. Oh. And, and it does vary. And they don't always, to my knowledge, use their own hoop houses, but that, that's obviously a, a farm decision. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, it, it's, tobacco is a, a very high risk, high reward crop and people vary the amount they grow from year to year quite a bit.
All I'm saying is that it's, it's not a constant. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I address a question to Julie, please? Yes. Julie, what was the name of that company again that's doing the charcoal filters? They're called Air Filters, Inc. Air Filters, Inc. Yep. They're an American company. If you Google, you'll see their website come up. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, it seems just to maybe round up the discussion that we, the board members, have three main uh, decisions to make. <clears throat> One would be the suitability of this new odor control plan. Two would be the, the um, approval of the uh, plan with the rebuilt barn. And three would be the um, issue we've just been discussing is the definition of the marijuana establishment vis-a-vis -vis the 50 foot setback requirement. I'm sorry, Roger, I was catching up with some things. Could you please repeat them for me, those three points? The first point was the um, suitability of the new odor control system the second was the um, right to rebuild the uh, destroyed greenhouse in the extended time period. And the third was the um, use of a portion of the barn to grow marijuana and thereby satisfying the 50 foot setback requirement. I would say I'm I'm bothered the least by the rebuilding of the of that destroyed greenhouse. Um, the odor control is you know it's the same situation we've been in throughout the whole marijuana era, which is that we don't know if it's going to work. We don't have any um, uh, operating facilities in town that we can point a finger at and say, hey it works over there or no, it doesn't work over there. So um, so that's familiar territory for us. And the third one is somewhat unique. Um, so I'm not sure if we're ready to close the, the hearing or we, do we want to seek any expert technical advice on the odor control aspect? What's the pleasure of the other board members? Well, I, I, I was more concerned about the iodine because I just didn't feel like I had enough information to evaluate that one. So now that that's off the table, um, and we have approved the, those, the charcoal odor controls before with, you know, with a condition that we revisit the smell issue after um, a year. So I, on that particular issue, I'm, I'm not sure I need out, outside expertise on the odor control issue. It's either going to work or it's not, and we're going to know. But it's, it's a benign form of odor control. It's not spraying an element into the air. I guess I'm interested in Bob's thoughts on what I... I gather to be a, a sympathetic ear, his sympathetic ear to the um, creation of the smaller space with the security fence, or excuse me, with the chain link fence. Well, I think that 
as I remember discussions when the marijuana laws were, zoning laws were first uh, established, um, allowing a farm to be able to use a structure that existed for this purpose seemed like a, a really great idea. And I think that Julie has exhibited again and again, a sensitivity to the preservation of this farm, um, the ability of the farmer to continue farming, um, a unique uh, way of allowing that to happen and for her enterprise to continue. Um, she was sensitive to the iodine question and switched over to uh, carbon, which uh, sort of is uh, all of us as life forms. Um, we can't argue with, with carbon. I just don't know um, how many more hoops um, we can ask people <coughs> to jump through. Um, I think that this is a, uh, the, the chain link fence is a, a creative solution um, that allows the, the, the farm to continue in the hands of the family that's owned it since their grandfather came from the old country, as they say. Um, those things matter to me. And it seems often that, you know, we don't, we don't question at all that they grow tobacco. Okay. Um, how harmful is tobacco? Well, I do. <laughs> I don't even need to go there. And I don't know if any of you have ever been around when they fertilize the greenhouses using the fish emulsion. And you talk about odor. Um, and, and none of that ever comes into question, but when it comes time for marijuana on a, on a existent farm, we have 7 million reasons why this shouldn't happen. And I understand, I understand the 50 foot setback. I, I understand that. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I don't know how much more um, information um, beyond what uh, Julian and her lawyer have given us. Um, that I need um, to feel satisfied. We don't know about the odor control issue and that's been said several times because we don't have any data because we don't have any up and running facilities. Um, as far as the, the security cameras and the uh, invasion of someone's privacy, I'm sure that we can work around that and have those pointing in a direction which is totally on the property, just as we do when we have lighting restrictions on um, when we grant uh, permits for various things and we downward facing lighting, inward facing, can't be out to the street. So I guess that's where I am, Roger. I'm, um, I'm just, I've listened and I, I understand, um, but these properties, um, this is a unique use of something that's a very narrow lot. Um, and I think they've done some creative thinking um, to try to make it um, possible. I don't think that the, the growing of the, the marijuana inside that um, 50 foot area is going to, um, is going to, the growing itself is not going to matter to the neighbors. I think the odor is going to matter and that's what we've got to manage. That's what we've got to be on top of. That's what we have to uh, perhaps write some sort of restrictions in, in terms of, you know, how often we want to check and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's where I am, Roger. All right. Well, I appreciate that speech. Um, and I, I'm taking it to heart. As far as restrictions are concerned, you know, we could use as a, as a model the ones that we approved originally for this uh, location, which I don't know if you have the package yeah. that was submitted, but it's gone in the den A. Especially if it's being used down there. I'm looking at it at work. Because related to odor was number two. I guess I'll say number two and three. Um, number two said members of the ZBA will visit the greenhouses during each of the first two blooming cycles to assess odor. 20 days before each of the first bloom times Urban Grown Inc. will send to the town clerk and to the chair of the ZBA a notice to visit on the first and second weekends after the 20-day notice. The board shall endeavor to send at least one representative. The visit will be restricted to ZBA board members. 
that was point two. And then point three said that the year that will determine the date of the one year review will start once the Cannabis Control Commission approval is received. Urban Grown must notify the chair of the ZBA in writing that the CCC approval has been received. The one year review will be an advertised public hearing at the board's first regular meeting that falls at least 12 months after the CCC approval. At the review hearing, the board will hear residents' comments, concerns, complaints, evidence, and testimony, and may impose any new conditions. So uh, those were important. That we also had point four, all lighting on the property must be directed downward onto the ground. Point five was that at least one odor scrubber is to be operated in each greenhouse. I don't know about that one. Does this system use any odor scrubbers, Julie? My knowledge is that a scrubber and a filter are essentially the same. And, and the way that we have the filter working, which is how a scrubber works, is it pulls air through the carbon. We could substitute instead that the filters shall be changed on a three, three month cycle. Mm -hmm. I saw you shake your head, but I think you're muted, Julie. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was a question that we're fine with that. Um, maybe we should say at least every three months. At least. <laughs> to, yeah. to be, if, if, if during the flowering cycle, sure. when it's particularly odiferous, perhaps <laughs> it would be um, more often. All right. <clears throat> well, I think I have my um, head wrapped around this. So unless there are any other public comments, uh, I would vote to close the public dialogue portion of the meeting and proceed to our public deliberation. I would second. Uh, Andrew, we have questions. There, Go ahead, there, was, there was a question just before you did that, Roger. Mike had a question. So what was the question? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, it's not so much a question, but this is to Mr. Smith for explaining everything and taking the time and Julie for all of her efforts and especially for getting away from the iodine uh, odor control thing that was kind of scary. So the biggest concern from us now would be just odor and Mr. Chairman, what you wrote in to how to assess it. I think is uh, is a is a fair way to go to all parties, and thank you all for listening uh, over the past few months. Well, you're welcome, Roger. I'd like to make a, a comment before or you, I guess, close. Uh, as an abutter, I, I'm also a, an alternate to ZBA, but I'm speaking a, as an abutter to this proposal, and. Uh, I guess I appreciate all the efforts gone into making a uh, uh, complete proposal and the efforts that Julie has to answer all our questions that keep coming up. Uh, I guess I'm confident that, that these owners, well, based on, on what I've seen in the past from the way they operate, what they grow, that they're, they're very dedicated, conscientious, uh, farmers that pay attention to detail, they pay attention to the neighborhood. They want to make sure they don't want people to be upset of the things they do. I, I guess I'm confident that they will know how to grow marijuana. And it just comes down to, I think, like the, the major concern of many abutters is, is the odor control. And I think, Roger, you can you can address that with the one year, one year uh, uh, time frame. So I guess I, I have no objection to them growing marijuana or even other crops in this greenhouses because they've been doing it for years and, and, and the neighborhood is used to it and, and we're comfortable doing it. All right. Thank you. Okay, we're on a roll. Um, I am going to uh, move to close the public dialogue portion of the hearing. Second. All right, well then, um, I have been swayed by Mr. Smith's eloquence 
and I would vote in favor of um, the petition as a whole. Uh, to break it down to its components, uh, I'd be in favor of the um, carbon control system that they have um, substituted with the conditions that we had previously imposed, and especially with the um, changing of the filters at least every three months. Um, I'm comfortable with the rebuild of that bar number five. Um, no, it's number one. And um, willing to, uh, willing to um, approve the um, chain link fence as the uh, perimeter to measure the 50 foot setback. So I, I would be in favor of, of the application. Yes, I, I would too. Um for those reasons, but also very strictly with those provisions about the odor control oversight that I think actually that should be, I'm sorry, somebody's in our waiting room. Um, I think that that really should be standard for all of our, our marijuana approvals because that does seem to be the sensitive issue. Bob? I, uh, I agree with both of you. I was wondering if um, if we should in in any way uh, seek to have Julie and her company reach out to the school committee um, to show them allow, uh, allow them a walk through, let them see um, what's going on. And uh, I mean, I don't know if that's a condition. It's just a. I think it might be helpful. Um, because they are, you know, they're, they are, of course, beyond the 500 feet that they need to be, but nonetheless, they're there. Um, I don't know how you, how you all feel about that, but I just think that, that that kind of reaching out and talking and walking through and seeing might be very helpful. That's a great idea. It's a good idea, but I, I don't know if you actually want it as a condition because, okay, I mean, it seems a little tricky to yeah. write up and enforce, but um, more to the point, I read the minutes that Mary had prepared and it said that there was going to be a dialogue between them that's actually in the minutes from December 4th. Right. I don't know if it's heard already, but you know, at least we're, we're on record that, that that was a goal. Um, okay. Okay. So then it sounds like we're unanimous. Yeah. But we'll have to write it up. Um, I'll volunteer to take the first crack at writing it and circulate it. Are you going to hold a, a, a vote on this or is that what you just did? <laughs> oh, so let's make it official. I'll, I'll vote in favor with the conditions that we've described, which are the <clears throat> conditions on the um, urban grown application as shown on addendum A being numbers two, three. Uh, well, <laughs> if we're gonna vote on all this, just slow down, please. <laughs> I can't write that fast. D described. Okay, with the conditions just described, and what were they again from? On addendum A to the urban grown application numbered as two, Three, four, and five, with five being modified to say that the carbon filters in each greenhouse shall be changed at least every three months. Okay. So then to make it official, vote in favor. Vote in favor. I vote in favor. All right, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
Thank Good you. Luck. Good luck. Thank you. We need it with the state process. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. So do we have the, um, I'm going to ask for a five minute break, but do we have the uh, gentleman who wanted to address us informally present? Yes. Pete, Pete Gleason? Yes. All right. We're going to take a, a five minute break and we'll be back in, at 8.05. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Excuse me.
I want to start a pool about how much snow we're going to get. <laughs> I say five inches. Have well, they changed the forecast? Uh, I think that it's now extended to, uh, you know, go a, a little bit heavier between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. than they thought. Oh, so what are they calling for? Yeah, somewhere in the three to six range, I guess. Ah, okay. But then again, they've been wrong pretty much all the time. So. <laughs> nice job to have when you don't have to be accurate and still get paid. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not good to go out in public though. Okay, I think we're all back. So um, Mr. Gleason had some questions about an accessory apartment and I asked Mary to send him the uh, <clears throat> section of our bylaw that has a definition about that. And so uh, he has to have some further dialogue with us. So, sir, go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, first off, thank you very much for uh, having me this evening and thanks for um, getting me on the agenda so quickly. Um, we are very much in the early stages of looking at potentially adding a, an accessory apartment to, a, to an existing barn that we've got on our property. And I, in, I had, not only reached out to the zoning board, but also re reached out to, to the, um, the FERCOG and uh, did speak with a building inspector and, and uh, felt that I really wanted to just come to you and ask you for some clarification on the accessory apartment de definition. Uh, we currently have a barn that we would like to upgrade um, that is currently 430, 450 square feet. And the the plan as it stands right now would be to try and create a 750 foot or so uh, apartment. Uh, it'd be a one bedroom apartment, three room apartment. Um, and um, so in looking at the definition, uh, I it, it says existing no more than 800 square feet, or if it's a new structure, uh, no more than 600 square feet. So with our thought process of a plan at 750 square feet, uh, is there an approach that we take to get that? Your barn exists now. Uh, yes, uh, the existing barn is about 400 and 430 square feet. Okay. Um, I do, if you want to see it, I do have a a satellite shot where I could show you it if that's necessary at this point. Do we want to see that, Roger? I can make Mr. Gleason a co-host. Okay. okay. All right, just one moment. Okay. You should be able to share your screen. Did that show up for you? No. Oh, okay, let me try it again. There we go. Now I think I got it. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, so um, the the area that we're talking here is circled or, or has a square around it in, in blue. So uh, essentially the thought process is to add uh, a little L right here that would be um, to the, should be to the east of the barn uh, with, a, with a little porch in the front of it. And um, our property line basically runs along this driveway up here. Uh, and so all of this is our land and, and back and through here as well. Um, okay, so the issue that you're describing is that you're not gonna be creating a living area in anything that exists right now, but you're adding to Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that is correct. Correct. Okay. And so, now this bylaw was just recently amended. So, I think I'm looking at this part of it for the first time. An additional dwelling unit of no more than 600 square feet may be added in a new structure. Roger, can you give me the page number, please? 
Oh, page I'm one. sorry. I, I have that if you want. I can. Yeah. Page 103, that. Deborah, but he's. 103. No, that's fine. I, I have my book with me. I just wasn't. 103. Okay. That's where I was a little unclear, and I didn't want to proceed without really. Um, I guess it could be interpreted in a couple of ways. And I just want to make sure that before we go forward that we're not making life miserable for everyone. Right, okay. So let's just do the math out loud here. And you, I think you repeated it, but or you said it, but I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Mm -hmm. so, I'm just going to hang this, it's like a scan caller. Okay. Um, It is 450 now? Uh, thereabouts, about 430, 450. Okay. 430, 450. Yep. It's 600, so you're over 1,000. You're like 700, 750 of it. Oh. On its face, that seems plausible. Uh, am I reading it incorrectly? I'm, I, I just want to look at this again. I'm, I'm an additional dwelling unit. I guess I'm seeing his point. Maybe, maybe the, maybe you can't combine. I, I'm, I'm. There's no expansion of square footage of any existing structure. An additional dwelling unit may be added in a new structure, but that's only to 600 feet. Am I misreading? Well, no, it's a little confusing now that we're looking in the- So the barn, the barn already exists. Mm -hmm. And so the additional dwelling unit consisting of no more than four rooms and no more than 800 square feet of living area in a, in a home or an accessory structure. But then an additional unit can be added in a new structure. Yeah, it is a little hard. Yeah. That's less clear than it used to be, I think. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. I'm actually going to pull Thank you. I, I was, I was okay. a little worried it was me. But no, uh, no, no. You know, we're <laughs> the experts. <laughs> I want to pull out the other one just to look at how it read before as a way of refreshing my minds here. We have no more than four rooms in a single family home. Boy, that is, that is foggy. Okay, the earlier one. Ends with the same sentence. Um, but ends after the 800 square feet of living area in the pre-existing single family home. So they added the language or an accessory structure provided there is no expansion of square footage of any existing structure and the structure has been in place for at least five years. So that second half of the first sentence is all new. All right. Then the old language said an accessory apartment may also be located in a pre-existing accessory structure, such as a garage or barn, provided there is no expansion of square footage of the accessory structure. Um, so that's gone. And then this new sentence appears, an additional unit of no more than 600 square feet may be added in a new structure. What does it mean a new structure? Yeah, I don't know. Is that a standalone structure? Um, and and why new? Why can't it be an existing structure? Well, I, I think they're trying to liberalize it by by giving this extra option. Well, but they they were trying to liberalize it. I do you remember. know what they should have said in a new or existing, because that would allow anyone to build a six hundred foot apartment off an existing barn. The new makes it more unclear. It sounds like, like how new? 
Right. <clears throat> but like I'm just thinking, thinking of my own house, for instance, we did an addition, whatever it was, 15 years ago. Yeah. It's, it, that new part of the house, we sort of considered it a new, a new structure. Yes, it was connected to the old house. So I'm. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, that's just I, how we no, no. think of it. And you've been to my house, Deborah. So, you know, there's, there's no, the actually, Roger, when you frame it like that, so you can add 600 feet in a new structure. I was thinking of it as adding 600 feet to a new structure. That is my misreading. Yeah, in a new structure. But then how about the no expansion part that, that <laughs> is oh, in the Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's what got me. Was... Yeah, and, that, and that was not there in the previous incarnation. Um, Oh boy. Yeah, that, that's like directly contrary, provided there's no expansion. Um, you know, hard, at, to, hmm. hard to reconcile the no expansion with the new structure. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Gleason, I'm sorry to say we, you know, we have no experience with it. <laughs> um, you know, but as I look at as I look at it at this moment, I'm seeing and and please, Bob and and Kristen and everybody. So if, if you were to, your barn is only 450 feet, right? Correct. So if you, if you wanted to put an apartment in the barn, mm -hmm. you can't be more than 800 feet. <laughs> Obviously that's, you know, that's not gonna work. Um, but if you built a new structure off the existing barn, that could be 600 feet. Okay, but not go, not exceed eight hundred in total. That's what that looks like to me. But I'm please please folks argue with me if I'm misreading. I'm thinking like we we recently approved an apartment in an existing structure, and they had a lot of space in it, and and it was right up to the seven hundred and fifty. Correct, Roger? Yep. Um, yeah. And, but that was an existing structure and they were putting the apartment in it. But you wanna add to an, to a structure. And so that would be the new, the new building. And that looks like it's limited to 600. <clears throat> yeah, but it doesn't really make sense. Why would there be no expansion um, if 800 feet is allowed? I know that is, that is, that seems capricious. Yeah, <laughs> and arbitrary. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> it's too bad we don't have Judy still on the on yeah. the side too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that new the new dwelling with the six hundred square feet. Maybe that's like a tiny home, one of those tiny homes they talk about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah could be, could be. I think that was mentioned in a town meeting. Yeah. I, and when I all, was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I, I was I was curious at whether maybe I, I was trying to. Uh, piece it together and I was wondering if maybe that 600 was targeted towards like an in-law or or something like that um but it makes total sense thinking about like a like a tiny home yeah I mean so just so you know the planning board writes these and the town approves and the town meeting approves and we the zoning board interpret them so okay so we are um excusing ourselves from it being in existence, we didn't create. <laughs> <laughs> We're just left to struggle with it. I don't know what to say. Um, should, should I reach out to the planning board and ask for clarification of that, or you can try? It can't, it can't hurt. You know, um, if there's a rational explanation, we might we might go along with it. But, I mean, from a technical standpoint. Once a once a legislative body adopts something that's and becomes the law or a bylaw in this case, mm -hmm. they don't really get a second bite of the apple to redefine it. And so, 
our body, which is more like the judicial body, has to interpret it, whatever the original legislative body says about it in the future. It's like, okay, well, maybe yes, maybe not. We're, we're stuck with the interpretation. But here, so ambiguous, I think we might welcome that. Okay. I, I will do what you feel best uh, with regards to that. Yeah. So but actually, Mary serves our recording secretary here, is uh, serves in a dual capacity, both the planning board and the zoning board secretary. So Mary, what's the best way for him to reach out? What's the best way for me to reach out? For him to reach out to the planning and, board. The uh, well, I could, I could set it up by emailing them, or Mr. Gleason could email them. Uh, Don, Don and Judy are mostly usually the ones handling, you know, those kinds of things. Um, the uh, planning board. Uh, I think it's a uh, plant planning board at waitley.com. I think, I mean, dot org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. I think it might be just planning at waitley.org. You're, you're right, Hannah. It's just planning. But is it not true that you would be, it looks as though this would be clearly allowed if you could get it to 600? Doesn't I, that seem pretty, pretty straightforward, yeah. Roger and Bob? Yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, my my question is there and lies the there is no expansion part of the thought process of this is this is a um, this is a kind of a historical building to uh, this property and its post and beam structure so we'd like to use the the architectural components of that to create this apartment so in, in doing so it would technically be an expansion. <laughs> huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. um, <laughs> I, I suppose we could uh, there we are probably uh, we've got a fair amount of work to do to it so I could technically call it a new structure using an, an old frame if you will um, well you know even tonight, we've talked about creative solutions. <laughs> um, so, hmm. yeah, I mean, the tricky thing about being on our board, uh, sir, is that we, because we're the decision makers, you know, we can't fully plan a project for somebody because, and, and in fact, the board members rotate sometimes, the alternates could vote. So, you know, we, I could say something to you right now and it's not binding on us. No, under, uh, understood. If um, voting. Why don't, why don't I uh, send an email? If you think it makes sense, send an email to the planning board and just see if I might be able to get a little clarification of the thought process here and, and That's the logical next step. In, okay. And, and then based on what I do there, that will kind of give me an idea of where I need to go. We're, we're so early in this process. I may go further down the road in developing a, an actual drawing and, and what have you, and then come back to you if we need to look at uh, you know, a special permit or, or such. Right, yeah, and then uh, well, no, you're right, yeah. Continue on that path. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So, thank you very much. I appreciate your time this evening. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night. Hannah, I think you wanted to address it. Yes, so it's been a long meeting. I'll make it brief. Um, the town of Waitley has received a grant from the Department of Housing and Community Development from the state of Massachusetts for $30,000 to develop a housing production plan for the town of Waitley. Um, to that end, we are reassembling the housing committee and are looking for volunteers from each board, at least one. Um, or not every board, but um, as many as we can get, I think representation across the town government is a great thing for this uh, organization. So I don't need any answers right now. I just wanted to let you know that this is something that we're looking into. Um, I'm hoping to have the committee convened by the end of the month. Um, and if you're interested, please let me know, reach out to me. My email is communitydevelopment at wheatley.org. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. I'm sorry you've had to stay so long for this. <laughs> It's good to know what's going on in the town. I'm glad I got the opportunity. <laughs> okay. Very diplomatic.
<laughs> I have a question for Hannah. Uh, since I'm a member of the of the uh, housing committee, I, I guess I was wasn't aware that we were expanding the committee, uh, which is good. But is what you're looking for now is this just for this housing what production plan that we got the grant money for, or is this a member a permanent member of the housing committee? What are you looking for? That's a great question. Um, I think right now we're looking for somebody to participate in the housing production plan. Um, I don't have a definitive answer as to whether or not this person would be staying on beyond that. Um, I can talk to Brian about the structure of the committee as well. Because that may make a difference of people that are interested. It could be a short term interest or continual interest, I guess. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, either way, if you're interested in just participating in the housing production plan production, let me know if you're interested in a longer term participation, that's great too. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Hannah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hey, Mary, I want to turn to your minutes. Thanks for sending them. <clears throat> I did read them. I had two very minor changes on Okay, the... I should say that they, they didn't make it onto the agenda, so we probably don't have to worry about approving them tonight. Um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to read them, they were so you know close to the meeting. It'd probably be better to approve them next week, but I can uh, put your changes. Well, next, next probably... month. Yeah, not next week. No, <laughs> no. Did I say next week? Next month. That's okay. okay. Nobody can keep time these days. <laughs> ne That's next meeting. We we don't have anything on the books yet for February. Yes. Uh, blank. <laughs> <laughs> Simply at the top, you have August fifth as the date. Oh dear. Okay. All right. So that would be the December date. And then um, at the end, you have the planning board instead of the zoning board. We'd say that. Okay, I guess I grabbed the wrong template. <laughs> Actually, well, it's, good are... it's good otherwise, but it says that documents reviewed are kept in the planning board files. Yep, I grabbed one of theirs <laughs> and changed it, but not enough. Otherwise, it looked good. Oh. Those are such great catches, Roger. Yeah. I thought the meeting, the, the minutes looked very good and I didn't catch those. So. Didn't catch those. Well, well done. Yeah. Mary, if, if we have nothing in February and, and you have a chance to gather together, you know, your your um, notes, we could knock off a, a number of those minutes. Yes, we could. If, if, if people want to get together just to do minutes, I will have yes. them. Yes, have them. absolutely. I would be relieved yeah. to have them gone too. Good. Okay. Cool. Mary, you, you write such detailed, wonderful minutes. I, I almost wish I could like be with you to do my reporter minutes that I'd have to write something really quickly that night and get it in. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Good seeing everybody. Okay. Good I'm going to have to stay on and rechange. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.